Okay, so let us start again. So the last speaker today, uh, of course not the least, is Raphael Portier uh, from uh, Uruguay, uh, Montevideo, yes. And he's going to speak under the title uh, Robust Dynamics, Invariant Structures and Topological Classification. Please. Thank you very much. It's really a great honor and a surprise to be here. And I'm very glad that you all came. So the, the subject of my talk is to try to characterize uh, robust dynamical behavior. And the point uh, would be to try to characterize it by using information that you can gather by looking at only finitely many iterates of a system. So I, I will start by giving an, an illustrative example, which more or less shows very nicely what I'm going for. So this was al also mentioned in Lorenzo's talk uh, recently. So this is a, a, by now, kind of old theorem by Franks and Manier, which states that in a if you have a closed surface and you look at a diffeomorphism of this surface, then this diffeomorphism will be robustly transitive if and only if it's an OSOV. So transitivity uh, is, a, is a kind of in the composability of, of a dynamical system. It means it has a dense orbit, but it's, this is just an example. And by this is the kind of dynamical property uh, I'm interested in. And robust transitivity means that this property persists under perturbations of the system. So one should be able to detect it by, by looking at an approximation of your system. And on the other hand, you have being an also, and this is what I mean by uh, admitting an invariant geometric structure and even though th this is uh, one definition, is the, the shortest possible definition, this is a, a condition that can be detected by looking at only finitely many iterates of, of the system. So this uh, result has kind of two steps. In this case, it's easier to get the, the converse direction. So if you have an anosov diffeomorphism of a surface, then necessarily the, the surface must be the torus, and f must be conjugate to a linear uh, hyperbolic automorphism. So and as, as we really know how the dynamics of linear automorphisms look like, and, and also being an open property, we get the converse. Much, uh, much deeper and, and later, uh, there's the result by Manier showing that robust transitivity implies that the system is an OSOV in dimension two. So in a certain sense, what's being proposed is that whenever you have a, a robust dynamical property, then uh, you, you should be able to get some invariant geometric structure that is forced by this uh, robust property. And the, the idea is that maybe to come back, it's a good idea to pass through a topological classification of, of the systems admitting these geometric structures, okay? So in, in, when you go to higher dimensions, uh, what you get is the following. So it's, by now it's, it's well known that robust dynamical properties, and this is just an example of, of a family of, of results that provide some geometric structures out of a robust dynamical property. But when the dimension is higher, the, the problem becomes harder because these uh, invariant geometric structures alone do not allow you to come back. So the, there are both, the, the result is, is sharp in, in terms of the geometric structure it provides, but it does not allow to come back. And so I, I mentioned here, there are similar results in, in related contexts. And 
but, but in this talk, I, I would like to concentrate in the converse direction. So try to, to get some dynamical property out of a, a geometric structure. So, so in a, to, to be a concrete, the, the problem would be to describe the space of robustly transitive diffeomorphisms to, to, to choose a, a dynamical property. And the key point would be to obtain the characterization in terms of information that you can, can detect in finitely many iterates. And the, the proposal is to, to do this via a topological classification of uh, the systems that admit such uh, robust, uh, they, uh, some geometric structure imposed by transitivity. And it's, it's important to, to know that even, even if we get a, a complete topological classification, if, even if we assume the, the, the most uh, ambitious of, of uh, conjectures, this is, this is not enough. So we, we still need to work even if we get a, a, a complete topological classification. But, but having a topological classification uh, over than being interesting by itself, it, it can also provide insight into having and learning uh, finer dynamical properties of, of the systems. And this is currently a very active uh, team of research. So in, in this talk, I, I will concentrate in the easiest possible context beyond the surfaces, which is, uh, will work in three-dimensional manifolds and assume a geometric structure, which is the easiest possible that we don't know how to deal with, okay? This is uh, what's called partially hyperbolic systems, and in this and today, this will mean that you have a, a, a continuous splitting into three bundles, which are invariant by the derivative, and they verify some uh, contraction and expansion properties. So, again, this is not evident from this definition, but this is something that you can detect by looking at only finitely many iterates and, and its derivatives. So, let me uh, show you a a figure or, or a, a drawing of what, what this means. And so you, you have this splitting in each point in the tangent space, which is invariant by EDF. So vectors here are getting contracted, vectors here are getting expanded, and vectors here are in intermediate. And below, what I draw here is, is a figure of how, how to pass the information of of the action of the derivative to the to the manifold, and what what you see is that for the strong bundles, this stable and unstable bundle, you you get something in the manifold that mimics the dynamics of the differential, but in the center direction, this is much more subtle, and this I draw by doing two lines, but if uh, whatever. So, which are the examples? we know of partially hyperbolic systems in dimension three. So, or even in, in higher dimensions, the list is, doesn't grow so much. So the, the first kind, and the probably most important kind, because everything then comes from them, is the, the algebraic and geometric constructions. So typically, in dimension three, this, this amounts to linear automorphisms of Torre and nil manifolds, and sometimes one maps uh, of an of flows, like suspension and of flows, and time one maps of geodesic flows in negative curvature. Also, there's a, a very important class of uh, skew product that uh, one can think of them as perturbations of some of these examples, but they, they, they should be pointed out separately because they they are very interesting in studying several dynamical properties and random dynamics or, or whatever. So you, you get kind of a, a hyperbolic dynamics times a, a slower dynamics, and you, you can think of it as a, as a, a 
a random part in the base and something that's uh, slow in the, in the fibers. But then in dimension three in particular, for anosov flows, there's a, a large tradition of constructing new anosov flows out of old ones, and there are several surgery constructions that allow to construct anosov flows in a lot of three manifolds. And okay, so I said partial hyperbolicity is an open property, and this allows one to make deformations of, of all the examples above, and the the point is that deformations can be made both small and large, and being large allows us to create examples that are kind of very different from the, the ones that, that existed before. But technically, there may be other ways to construct examples, but it's, it's important to know the, the list we have so far. And so before I, I really explain what I mean by topological classification, let me uh, say why, why there's some hope to, to get somewhere if you want to classify these systems in dimension three. So the, the first point is that in a, we, we really know kind of a lot about topology and geometry of uh, three manifolds, and in particular its relation with foliations of inside. And the foliations really appear when you have a partially hyperbolic system, the one hand via the existence of these one-dimensional foliations I already kind of mentioned, integrating the strong bundles, which have the, the particularity that they don't have closed orbits, because they, they, there cannot be a circle tangent to a uniformly contracting or expanding direction. But much deeper is the existence of kind of foliations which are tangent to the center stable and center unstable direction. And this follows from a, a very deep work by Burago and Ivanov, which provide uh, some geometric objects which in some sense behave like two-dimensional foliations because they can be approximated by foliations which have a reasonable good structure. I will, I will explain now with a couple of drawings. So, Branching foliation, a, a branching foliation in a three manifold is a partition of, of the manifold by complete surfaces which cover the whole manifold, but they, they may merge. You, you might have two leaves that merge in, inside one. But the key important property is that they are invariant by the dynamics. So you, you get Burago and Ivanov provide these objects tangent to the CS and CU direction which are invariant by the dynamics and for which the leaves do not topologically cross. As they do not cross, you can kind of approximate them by true foliations. And the interesting point that they remark is that these true foliations that they approximate cannot have rib components. And so what's a rib component uh, very quickly? It's it's a foliation of the solid tori, which has a, a, a picture more or less like this. But the point is that if you have a one-dimensional foliation transverse to a, a component like this, you must have a, a circle tangent in, the, in this foliation. And as I said, the one-dimensional foliations you have do not have closed orbits. And this is a very good starting point because kind of rib components for foliations in three manifolds are kind of the analog the, the analogous uh, as, as singularities for vector fields in surfaces. And so they give you the chance to get some uh, information of the foliation uh, if you know that they don't have rib components. Okay. But what, what are the, the difficulties? And so there are several ones. Uh, probably this one, so as I, as I mentioned, we have a, a big list of examples. We have kind of ideas of what the classification should be, but there are several recent new examples, and, and we don't really know if 
new ones may or may not exist. So we don't really have a clear proposal by now for classification. Also, the fact that ECS and ECU do not necessarily integrate into foliation is, is a problem for classification because they, they impose some difficulties. And probably the, the most weird uh, problem is that we don't really know how to classify a of flows in three manifolds. So uh, why, why should we really even care on classifying partially hyperbolic systems? But kind of this problem uh, has been addressed in a, in a more or less old conjecture by Enrique Puchels, saying that w what we should do is not to classify an of flows. We should compare partially hyperbolic systems to an of flows. And so that's kind of what we aim to do. Okay, so the, the problem now, now I'm trying, I will try to explain a little bit more uh, uh, concretely what, what do I mean by the classification problem. So the problem divides uh, more or less naturally into three uh, sub problems. The first one, uh, already appear, apparent, is that the center direction, which is a one dimensional uh, bundle, it, it integrates uh, because it's a one dimensional continuous bundle, but typically it's not more than continuous, and so there's no reason it should integrate into an F invariant foliation. Sometimes it even doesn't. And so uh, understand when the center direction integrates is a, it's an important issue when trying to classify. Another important problem in classification is understand which manifolds and which homotopy classes of diffeomorphisms of these manifolds can admit partially hyperbolic diffeomorphisms. And, and then uh, the, the ultimate goal would be to try to describe the dynamics of center leaves whenever they exist. So try to uh, understand what, what is the, the structure of the foliation tangent to the center and how does the dynamics permute the center leaves of this uh, foliation or whatever you have there. And the, the key point is that it's, it's, not, it's not easy to attack any of these problems alone. You, you really need to attack the three of them at the same time if you want to make progress. It's, maybe there's a way, but uh, there's no known way to attack isolatedly one of these problems. Okay. Okay. So, so far, the, the approach that has been taken to, to attack this problem is first of all to, so, so for in three manifolds, as I mentioned, we, we kind of have a, a, a list of three manifolds. And we more or less understand how diffeomorphisms act on these manifolds. And so it makes sense to, to try to attack one manifold at, at a time or, or what one isotopy class at a time. And so that's uh, what's happening uh, today. And the, the, the point is try very briefly is to try to understand the structure of these branching foliations or foliations and try to use the, the, the dynamics, uh, but this is very rough. So you, you know the isotopy class of your diffeomorphism and you know the structure of your foliation and you try to uh, impose kind of a coarse dynamics of these uh, leaves in terms of the isotopy class of the diffeomorphism. And then if you succeed in doing this, sometimes you, you, you are able to compare to the model examples that you already know. So that's, that's the, the, the approach. And sometimes when you start doing this, you start finding some topological uh, obstruction or you show that the bundles are integrable or that they are not integrable or whatever. Okay. So now let me be even more concrete about what I mean by classification. So it, first of all, 
I, I, I'm defining here the notion of integrability of the center. It's not really clear that this is the best definition. It's not the necessarily the natural definition. There are many possible variants for this, but uh, in time we kind of converged to, to this definition. And the, the kind of the point of using this definition. So the definition is, we say that a partially hyperbolic system is dynamically coherent if both the, both the CS direction and CU direction integrate into F invariant foliations. So we don't speak about uniqueness, and that's good because uh, we, we shouldn't. But we do ask that both bundles integrate to foliation, they are two-dimensional, and that's important because we want to use theory of two-dimensional foliations. So this is a drawing of, of this integrability property. And if you have two dynamical systems which are dynamically coherent, so the notion of equivalence that we will use in partially hyperbolic systems is the notion of leaf conjugacy that goes back to uh, Hirsch, Pugh, and Schub, and which asserts that what, what I said at the beginning. So the, the, there's a homeomorphism that maps the center foliation of one diffeomorphism into the other and makes that the dynamics of both foliations, how the, the maps permute the leaves, is the same. So that's the, the diagram. In the, in the case where you have non-dynamically coherent examples, which, they, which exist, there is not so clear way to classify. So if, if you're interested, there are some proposals in the, in the survey paper, but uh, I won't discuss that. Okay. So the first result I want to, to talk about is a, is a result, is a, is a classification result that we obtained with Andy Hammerlindel, which treats the, the most simple and smallest kind of manifolds, which are torus bundles over the circle. So up to some reductions that de depend on many previous work, and notably what I mentioned of Burago and Ivanov, if the fundamental group of your manifold is small, being, meaning virtually solvable, you can reduce, reduce the study uh, of partially hyperbolic systems to torus bundles over the circle. So meaning T3, what's called nil manifolds, or sol manifolds. Essentially, if, if you cut along a torus of your manifold, you get T2 times the interval. And depending on how you glue, you get a different manifold. And in that case, we, we have a mostly complete uh, classification of partially hyperbolic systems. I, I won't read the, the statement of the theorem, but either you have a torus tangent to the CS or CU direction, or you are leaf, uh, dynamically coherent and leaf conjugate to an algebraic example. Okay, all of these examples are algebraic. And so this is up to finite lift and cover, but we, we can also precisely classify the quotients and lifts and iterates or whatever, and and even the, the ones that have torus tangent to CS or CU that that need to be taken into account thanks to some examples by Hertz, Hertz, and Uris. And the the, the key ingredients of uh, of this, uh, this result depend on the fact that we are in small manifolds. Okay, so in, in this kind of manifolds, we, it's, it's not difficult to, to obtain a, a precise classification, at least at big scale, of which are the possible foliations that these manifolds can have. And of course, this is very important to, ha to have no rib components. And also, it's very important that once you, you look at an isotopy class of a diffeomorphism, there's an almost unique algebraic model that can be the, the, the one that F has to be conjugated to. So we, we already know where we are going. 
and that that is also very important in the in the in the proof of this theorem and then this is something I already say so the the isotopy class of the diffeomorphism and the fact that we know how the foliation look like allows us to uh, force the dynamics on the on the on on the leaves of the foliation and in this particular case of torus bundle over over the circle we always get infinite separation of leaves after iteration so I, I, I don't want to explain exactly what this means but this is the key fact that allows us to get for example dynamical coherence or, and then classification and uh, of course this depends on on many uh, of a lot of previous uh, important work okay so let me see So what, what happens if we go into larger uh, dimensional manifolds? Uh, dimensional, no. So larger manifolds in terms of the fundamental group. So what, what should this mean? So, if, so the, the solved manifolds that I mentioned before do have exponential gro growth of fundamental group, but they are solvable, so not so large. So now we would like to focus on manifolds for which the fundamental group is, is large enough, it has exponential growth, but not solvable, and in, in that setting, we, do, is, is we enter in the place where we, we don't necessarily know how to classify a of flows, foliations do not really separate, and there are, all these ingredients are lost, and so the, the the questions need to be more modest in, the, in this setting, at least for now. And some questions that one can ask is whether if you have a manifold like this, which admits a partially hyperbolic diffeomorphism, does it admit an Anosov flow? And assuming that, that it, this is the case, then can we compare a partially hyperbolic diffeomorphism in, a manif in such a manifold with an Anosov flow in some way. So it turns out that for some large manifolds, the, 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 there's some illusion. So uh, let me say in, in ciphered manifolds, which are kind of the, the next class in complexity. We, which are, if you don't know what they are, so up to finite cover, they are circle bundles over higher Shino surfaces to, to meet the condition on the fundamental group. And in this setting, we, we really know how to classify an of flows. So, and, and they, they are all algebraic, in fact. And also, there, there's a nice theory of foliations for, uh, for these manifolds and in particular those which do not have uh, rib components. But the, the, the m most difficult issue is that if you, if you think, for example, at the center stable foliation of, a, of the geodesic flow in, in cur negative curvature, and you lift to the universal cover, then the, if you take two center stable leaves, then they are bounded distance apart one from the other. So uh, you, you don't really get separation of leaves in the, in the universal cover. That, that is truly a problem. But by now we, we know how to say a, a couple of things. So let me say what we know. But there are still things we don't. And so first of all, we have a, a result with Andy, Andy Hamerlin and Mario Shannon that states that if you have a partially hyperbolic diffeomorphism in a safer manifold, we need to add some hypothesis. Transitive is enough, but uh, the, there are much weaker hypotheses that allow to do this. Then the, the circle bundle, the cipher manifold must admit a, an Anosov flow. In particular, this says surface times a circle does not admit partially hyperbolic diffeomorphism. And, but it's kind of m more surprising is that we were able to construct several isotopy classes of partially hyperbolic uh, of uh, 
diffeomorphisms of uh, cipher manifolds that, that, that admit partially hyperbolic representatives. And when we constructed these, these new examples with uh, Bonatti, Gogolev, and Hammerlindel, we noticed that they cannot be dynamically coherent, for example. So they, they, can, they, they can be uh, robustly transitive, stably ergodic, whatever, but the center direction may not integrate into a foliation. And this really poses some problems in classification. And we also found some other obstruction for isotopy classes to admit partially hyperbolic representatives. And more recently, with uh, Thomas Bartelme, Sergio Fenley, and Steven Frankel, what we did was to start studying partially hyperbolic diffeomorphisms, which are homotopic to identity. So we changed uh, a bit the, the, the approach. And we assume that a partially hyperbolic diffeomorphism is homotopic to identity and say, well, what, what can we say? And so in cipher manifolds, what, what we can say is that F must be dynamically coherent and leaf conjugate to an anosov flow. Okay, so it has to be up to an iterate, but uh, it's, it's no problem. Okay. Okay, so I, I, uh, I'm very happy with this. It's a, I think it's a, a nice result, but then the, the, the study of the class homotopic to identity is, is kind of rich. And it has led us to, st in fact, we started this to understand the case of hyperbolic manifolds. So let me speak now about this class of manifolds. So first, I, I, I should say something about hyperbolic manifolds. So a hyperbolic manifold is a, is a closed tree manifold, which is a quotient of the upper half space in dimension three by a, a subgroup of isometries. So in principle, it's, it's, it's kind of surprising that, that this even exists. But in some sense, this uh, is the largest class of, of three manifolds after very deep uh, work uh, in the recent years. But and also, uh, that's the reason we started to study the class of diffeomorphisms homotopic to identities, the fact that there's a, a rigidity result by Mosto that implies that every diffeomorphism of a hyperbolic manifold has an iterate which is homotopic to identity. So if, if you wish to understand partially hyperbolic systems in hyperbolic tree manifolds, then you should understand uh, diffeomorphisms which are homotopic to identity. And for homotopic to identity, you, you kind of expect at least to, to be able to compare yourself to an Anosov flow, because that's the only examples we know in uh, homotopic to identity. The problem in, in, in hyperbolic tree manifolds, we have several open questions about Anosov flows. So we don't know which hyperbolic tree manifolds admit Anosov flows. We know that there are an infinite family that admits, an infinite family that doesn't, and an infinite family we, where we don't know. And we don't even know if they admit a unique kind of uh, an awesome flow. So we don't really have a model to, to compare with. And that's a difficulty. And the result is, is not so satisfying. I, I will explain why. But what we get is that if you have a partially hyperbolic diffeomorphism in a hyperbolic tree manifold, then either the center stable and center unstable directions integrate into two dimensional foliations and this dynamical coherence, and they are leaf conjugate to, a, to an anosov flow, or F must be very similar to the examples I mentioned before in a precise way. I don't want to to really explain a lot. So let me say, so we call these potential uh, examples that we don't know if they exist, double translation. So the, let me probably 
explain a little bit how, how they appear before it's easier to, to explain this. So essentially, so what, what's the strategy to, to approach this problem? So the, the, the first naive strategy that one would try to ap apply is you go to the universal cover, and so you, you are in H3, and you lift your map there. So the, the point that you are homotopic to identity means that points are moved a bounded distance away by, by F. So if you manage to show that these branching foliations get very much separated in the universal cover, then they will be forced to be fixed by this uh, leaf to the universal cover because uh, points are moved a finite distance away and if you have two leaves, any two leaves of the foliation get infinitely separated, then they should be fixed by the dynamics. And in fact, that's kind of the strategy in the solved manifold case. But this is, is doomed to, to fail because in hyperbolic manifolds we have and also flows for which the foliations are what's called uniform. Every pair of leaves is at bounded distance away, like in the Seifert manifold case and the geodesic flow I, I mentioned before. So what we need to do is to kind of find dichotomies for the dynamics of these foliations. So either every leaf of this foliation is fixed by the leaf to the universal cover, or we have a very nice structure on the foliation. The foliation is any two leaves are bounded distance apart and, this, and the leaf space of the foliation is aligned where F is acting as a translation. And once you are acting as a translation, what you get is that you have any two leaves, they are moved by F uh, as, uh, by above. And then when you, if, you, if you manage to get a periodic CS leaf, then when you look at the dynamics there, what you need to do is to apply F a couple of times and then a deck transformation to come back. And deck transformations in hyperbolic manifolds are more or less well understood. And this force some coarse dynamics in the CS and CU leaves that either force the non-dynamical coherence or whatever. So the, the potential double translation example would be that both CS and CU foliations are moving like this and you kind of control the course dynamics. And so uh, kind of, uh, to, to close a little bit the, the circle, let me say uh, what, what uh, purpose a theorem like this can serve if we don't really know whether this example exists or not. So let, let me say, I, I really think this example exists, but it, it's very hard to, to construct examples without uh, explicit examples. So in these examples mentioned here, we, we use a lot the geometry of surfaces to, to make some kind of surgery construction. And here it's not clear how to, to apply this, this argument because we cannot change the, the isotopy class. But even, though, even in having this result, we are able to get dynamical consequences of the classification, which was kind of the initial goal. And so let me mention a, f a few. I hope we, we can obtain better results, but we have some dynamical consequences in hyperbolic manifolds. Uh, I, I will mention two. One is, is kind of almost automatic, if I had defined what the examples are, is that if you have a partially hyperbolic diffeomorphism of a hyperbolic tree manifold, then F cannot have contractible periodic points. By this I mean a periodic point, you have a, a diffeomorphism which is homotopic to the identity, so if you look at a periodic point, you can follow the homotopy, and this will give you a curve in the manifold, so this curve can never be homotopically trivial. Okay? So this is a, a, a direct consequence of the classification result I mentioned before. And, uh, and another result that it's, it really needs a little bit more work, but, uh, 
but this work kind of has to do with the, the ideas that uh, appear in the classification allows us to show with Sergio Fenley that conservative partially hyperbolic systems in hyperbolic tree manifolds are always ergodic. And this, this is in, embedded in a, in a big line of research that has to do with uh, Pugh and Schub conjecture, and it's, it's known by many results that ergodicity is abundant in this setting, but this is not being abundant, this is being always ergodic. This, uh, there are previous results in other three manifolds by Herr, Hertz, and Urs. So these were the, the dynamical properties I, I wanted to, to present, and so I, I will end with a couple of uh, more speculative questions, I don't know what uh, a couple of questions would be, uh, so I, I would be really be interested in, in uh, expanding this uh, understanding of, of dynamical properties using the fact that your partially hyperbolic system belongs to a certain class. So this, this is already happening. So you can always assume that your partially hyperbolic system is in a certain class, but it's nice to know that all of them belong to that class. <coughs> and finally, um, a more open-ended question is if, if using this uh, topological classification or, or maybe change it so uh, within a topological uh, class of examples can, can we understand how does the boundary of robustly transitive diffeomorphism look like and uh, a, a very naive question I, I, I put in the survey but I, I'm, I'm not sure is whether for example is it true that the maximal entropy measure in the boundary should have zero Lyapunov exponents. And so that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So I, I think I can accept a few questions or comment. Okay, if not, then let us thank the speaker again.